Good morning, everyone. Uh, the first service we realized because we have people online, so we can say good evening to some people, good afternoon to some people, and good morning to some people. It's, it's great that everyone's here. So um, these are our announcements this morning. Um, first of all, don't forget to get um, pick up at the Welcome Center the prayer focus for this month, which is the area of Asia. All right, so that's excellent. And then also we have Wings of Glory. Um, if you haven't gotten, please pick up because it's, it's awesome just to look at and to reflect and to pray and to meditate and think about our brothers and sisters around the world and what God is doing in our ministry. And then um, recommendation, um, if you have a cell phone, please silence your cell phones. That way there won't be any ringing, interruptions, distractions of the sort during service. Um, and then lastly, if you didn't get your convention donation stuff, um, you can get it in the cafe after service, okay? And then um, we just want to ask if anyone's here for the first time. Um, this is your first time at a Greater Grace service. Um, we just want to recognize you, and we're so excited you're here. If you don't mind raising your hand, if that is you, anyone first time? Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming. Anyone else? Wow. Thank you, folks, in the back here. We're so excited that you're here. We have our ushers have for you a welcome packet. Um, just so you can tell us a little bit about who you are, and also we can tell you a little bit about who we are, all right? And um, so, yeah. And um, how many are, uh, we'll pray for you after service, but how many are leaving after service? You came for convention and you're leaving. Wow. Okay, so we'll make sure we pray for you guys before service is over, all right? So we had a great week, and I've seen the answers of prayer. Uh, the Lord has really visited us and encouraged us and spoken to our hearts, and we just rejoice in that. And also the great team of people here in Baltimore that did such a great job serving the body. and. You know, I think the youth program was amazing. I didn't get to go to any of the events, Hershey Park, Beaver Dam, is it, or what's the name of that place? Something like that. And uh, even the nursery had like animals, live little animals. And uh, uh, my grandson had a, a snake around his neck. And, um, you know, I said, don't ever do that again. <laughs> um, the the um, feedback, I'm, I'm hanging out with young people under the tent and, and just talking and, and how do you like being here and, and do you, why do you like it and um, I talked to a young group from Chicago, and I said, do you, do you, how many hours to drive here from Chicago? They said, like, 14. And then I said, do you like coming? Oh, yeah, it's the highlight of our year. And I said, why? They said, um, and these are, they're now, like, graduates from high school, and they're, but they've been coming every year, and it's like their family vacation time. And they just said, even it's the time when our year starts, like convention is our New Year's, and uh, uh, we get to be with our family, we get to come here, we go to the hotel, we get to swim in the pool, might go to Ocean City, we get to be here and uh, be part of this. And it's so beautiful to see that, that kids get to know each other. Camp Life is another big one. Camp Life Europe is another one. And I just, uh, 
Uh, our children are so important to us and what the Lord is doing in their hearts and that he would open their hearts and they would be able to hear and learn and, and follow the Lord and know the Lord. What a joy. Well, years ago, we, we had a team go to Hungary. We moved to Budapest, 1990. The team uh, went there in, in February, and we came in the summer, my family and I. And in a, in a short time, we met many Hungarians. We met Romanians, and Julian, Pastor Julian, is one of those Romanians who, after the Iron Curtain fell, people could move around in Eastern Europe and go also so go to Western Europe and go to the West. So uh, he, he was working in an area, Adeli Gat, just in the forest, and uh, uh, just a great guy. He started to come to our meetings and really hear and really, really embrace what he was hearing. And I remember those months and years when he was coming. And this is now a long time has passed. And um, what God has done in his life and his family, his brother Daniel went as a greater grace pastor to Africa. His sister Juliana went to Peru as a missionary. He has another sister, Christina. He has another brother, I believe, in the UK. Uh, but this family and, uh, and the heart that he has for God. So he's been a missionary in China. I don't even know all the places. Uh, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, uh, Romania. He's planting a church in Cluj, Romania with John Post. And, uh, and he, he travels a lot. He has a gift of evangelism and pastoring people. And I just love this guy. His name is Pastor Julian Timothy. So he's going to come and share. Yeah. Good morning, family. <laughs> it's so beautiful to be here. And uh, if Pastor John and Diane are here, I don't see them. Maybe they're in the morning service anyway. So Team Cluj, it's uh, really beautiful to see how God is, uh, is working. This past year, we've been uh, ministering in many villages and uh, in the city. And uh, God has given us uh, opportunities to... Uh, to minister and uh, to encourage other churches in, uh, in outreaches. And uh, there was a, a Baptist pastor who, who told me that we have this church, this Baptist church, and uh, it's dying because uh, no young people, and uh, would you like to go and help? So we went, and uh, you know, the first time the elder of that church said, you know, I, I, I cannot go out, you know. You know, I mean, it's only one. The people are old in the church. No one will come to outreach. But then he said, just because he was ashamed to say no, he came out with us. But then he started to like it. And then he started to talk to people. And then people start to come to church. And then he, say, he saw that people start to get saved. He was like, wow, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm telling you, Outreach, it's amazing. It's amazing when, when you just go out and you, you meet people and, and people meet the Holy Spirit, they meet Jesus Christ, they meet the Father and things are changing in their life. To see how God is touching people. I have a friend, he was coming with us and, and uh, you, he saw us leading people to Christ. And then he said, I didn't really believe that that's happening, you know. Like people need to come to church. They need to, you know, be long time. And then it's happening something. And then and they need to be baptized. And, and then he wants share with someone. And that person starts to cry. 
And she said, I had, I had no idea what to do. I was sitting there, staying there and look at her. And then the lady who was with him started to continue to share. And that lady received Christ. And then she started to come to church. You know, it's important. Our ministry is not only to the lost, but also to our brothers and sisters who maybe lost their way. You know, because we we all been lost. And I, I really like that uh, in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says that the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And how many times, you know, even in our life with God, we are lost? Maybe in a trial. Maybe a sickness. Maybe sin. Maybe a bad, you know, something which happening in our life. And God came and he seek us and he saved us again and again and again. And when Jesus left, you know, in, uh, he, Jesus was speaking to the disciples in John chapter 16. In verse 5, he says, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Is to your advantage that I will go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus went, and the disciples were filled with sorrow. They, they, you know, they say, what will happen with us? And when, when Jesus died, seven of, of his disciples, they said, okay, we go fishing. It's done. He left what will happen with us? Let's go back to our old business. But when Jesus came back, he was looking for them. And then, you know, he gave them promise. And then he said in Acts chapter 1, you know, don't depart from Jerusalem, but you shall receive the promise, the Holy Spirit, and you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the most parts of the, the world. He said, I give you the Holy Spirit, and he will lead you, because the spirit is not the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. And he will save you in situations. He will lead you. He will guide you. He will minister to you. He will encourage you. He will build you up. He will teach you. And then he will lead you to look for other people who are lost into this world. And you can say, I was lost. I was lost. I was in darkness. I didn't know the direction. I didn't know what to do with my life. But when Christ came, my life changed. And the Holy Spirit, it's amazing that He leads us to give the right questions to people. I love when God asking questions. Adam, where are you? Elisha, what are you doing here? Whom the people say that I am. He's putting these questions and we think, okay, what's the answer? And then God gives the answer. Because he gave us the word and he gave us the spirit. And he will teach us, he will correct us, he will reprove us, and he will go with us everywhere we go. And sometimes when you listen to people and you say, Lord, I have no idea what to say. And then the spirit gives you. A question gives you a word for that person in season. And many times it happened in evangelism that really the Holy Spirit gave me the right words to speak. And he touched that person's heart and that person received Christ. Because the work to seek and to save is not ours. It's God's. And the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son, they are working together and they are teaming with us. To go when we go to look for these people. So I want to encourage you. Just go. Talk to your neighbors. Talk, talk to the people at your workplace. People in the streets. We can ask questions. We can help people think. We can help people see that they are lost. And they need a savior. Because some, sometimes. Ago. Someone asked us a question. Because you know what? If God will not seek us, we will not even know that we are lost. But he seek us. He show us that we are lost. 
and we need a savior. God bless you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Good word, huh? Yes. Yeah, that was good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We were at Silver Spring the other day and uh, evangelizing on a street corner, and I, I felt that too, like just being refreshed. What a, it was a real, something about it happened on that, in that area, in front of the Panera Bread in Silver Spring, and uh, it was just, I don't know what it was, but it was like, wow, this is beautiful that we are, are talking to people about Christ. That was amazing, that was so good. So I, I think a believer that doesn't have that, like in your whole life as a believer, then you're missing something. So you, you want to learn to be, to be able to talk to people that you don't know. People that you know, of course, and then people that you don't know. And sometimes it's just little by little, little by little. Did I tell you that funny little story I told you? I think I was at the pool swimming, and I go into the steam room, and there's two young guys, and they're talking. And um, I find out after I talk to them, they're 33 and 30 years old, and they're talking about how they can't find a woman, can't find a wife. <laughs> you know, so I'm listening for a little while, and then I, you know, can I jump in and, and say something? I said, what are you talking about? You mean like can't find like a good woman? And they said, yeah, like, I go, what's missing? They said, character, I guess, trust, trust. And of course, the follow-up comment by me could be, where are you looking? <laughs> right? So, but I didn't say that, but I just went right to it. I said, I'm a pastor of a church. My church is packed with single <laughs> women that are amazing. And I'm not kidding, after like one guy goes out, the other one I talk with him, he plays in a band, and I asked him the name of the band, I Googled it, and uh, really, really he's there, and uh, you know, I had to, I, I hope I will see them again. But the other one that went out, when I went out by the pool, he came up to me and he shook me hand, my hand, he said, thank you very much. <coughs> All right, so here, here's our, the story. It's not over. I might see them again. I might bring them in here. <laughs> and I want you ladies to behave. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll, we'll do the offering right now. So please give in the offering. Uh, let's see, who could I do a shout out? How about... Pastor Brian, would you like to pray for the offering? Just come on right down front. Yeah. Hey, love this guy, huh? Come on. Hey. <laughs> okay, let's pray. So, Father, um, yeah, we, we give you really what's yours, Lord. We're so thankful that you use it however you please, and that we are so thankful to be part of it. Bless this offering, the song, and uh, Lord, all of our travelers as they, as they head back, many people, and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen.
just want to say, I don't, I know there's, some of you don't know the song I'm going to sing was written by our founding pastor, Pastor Stevens. And I was amazed to know that some people don't know that, and it's such a good song. So with that in mind, thanks. <laughs> Okay, turn in your Bibles, please, today to Romans chapter 8. I know that some of the folks who came from Europe are going back, Pastor Tony Cooper, Switzerland. Pastor Steve DeVries, great to have you. He's going to Kentucky. Uh, the Indians that are here in a couple of days, so we get to spend some time. Uh, the Chinese, I met with them, a group of them, uh, yesterday as they were leaving this morning. 
And we just feel very honored that people came and spent the money and the time and made the effort. And, and we have our family barbecue, our big, big old fashioned, you no know, spiritual communion fellowship. It's been great. Thank you for your love and prayers and what the Lord is doing in many levels and many ways. And we recognize it and appreciate it. I'd like you to read with me just for the first part of our sermon today from verse 31, Romans 8. This is the deep thing, the real things that are important in life, the very deep and powerful thing. I want to put here a word, providence, providence of God. This word is, in some sense, people would say it is old-fashioned. It's replaced by different concepts like deism, uh, deism is one, pantheism is another one, pantheism, uh, just to give you something to think about and look up, study it, randomness, randomness or chance, this is a modern view, there is no purpose or plan, it's all random, what happens in life is a matter of chance and then uh, fatalism. There isn't any end game. There's no end game in life. It's incredible that the secular world gets away with these ideas, these last two ones, particularly these. It's amazing that they are not challenged more on how ridiculous it is to believe that we exist by chance. There is no plan. There is no purpose. We're not going anywhere. A hundred billion years from today, our sun is burned out. The solar system is no longer like it was. All the graves, the cemeteries, every, all human being, all evidence of our culture, civilization, history, identity is all gone and it means nothing, zero. It means absolutely nothing. That is propagated and believed passively in many cases, actually without people talking about it and thinking about it. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's replaced in our mind, because we found Christ, we have this word providence. God created with a purpose. Everything that happens is subject to the providence of God. Watch. Oh, no. I hope I didn't break them. That was to be an illustration. Was that, what was that? That just happened. That is God holding it together, God holding the atoms together, God putting it having authority over everything, bearing everything, carrying it in a bucket. Actually, that's a good verse to take note of, Hebrews. <clears throat> I really am going to say something here, but we're going to get there in a while. That Jesus is holding everything together or carrying it. The better translation, he's carrying it like as in a bucket. He is holding it together. He is carrying it for a purpose. It started, he is carrying it, and he's going to accomplish it. Okay, so providence. Get used to using it and use it in your everyday conversations. The providence of God. There's a car accident. The providence of God. Somebody died. The providence of God. There is no, in the absolute sense, there are no accidents. God is everywhere. God has all authorities. And every little unit of time, however small, 
He is everywhere and everything is happening according to his purpose. It isn't necessarily his perfect will as, for example, Adam and Eve sinning. That was not his perfect will, but he allowed it. In his providence, he gave us the free will to sin, and we have sinned. But in his providence, he has provided for us something of an incredible nature, incredible reality that transcends us. And it shows us his wisdom, isn't it, Ephesians 1, um, 4 to 6. In his will, we see his wisdom in the providence, the plan, the coming of Christ, the crucifixion in the plan of God, the resurrection, the providence of God, the second coming, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, your ability to meditate and receive and relate to God in faith. This shows his wisdom, isn't it? Okay. Go to Romans 8, verse 31. Actually, I'm sorry. We, we better go back to 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you are born again, you fit into that category, verse 28. You have, you love God. That's the mark of a believer. You are born of God. You didn't love God, but now you love God. How? The new heart and the Holy Spirit in you. You love God. Do you, are you called according to his purpose? Yes. What's the purpose? To be conformed to his image. What's why? To glorify God. To become like Christ. Well, when? One day later, when we are, we are resurrected, we will be like him. But in this life, we are conformed to his image. If we live in the spirit, it happens and this is our nature now. We live in the Spirit. If we are a believer, we live in the Spirit. Just don't grieve the Spirit. It's nothing we do but simply live in faith in God, and we are Spirit-filled. And I do not grieve the Spirit or quench the Spirit, but I walk by faith, and the Spirit governs your life. Romans 8, I'm sorry, 6. 17, Romans 8, 7 through 11. Okay, verse uh, 28 again. We know all things work together for good. And of course, there's pain in life, failure, sin, problems of all kinds. Do they all work for good? Yes. That's what he says, it all works for good. How so? Because we will be conformed, it's a guarantee, we will be conformed to the image of Christ. How could it be better? That at the end game, the end game in the providence of God, the end game is there is no sin, there is no pain, there are no tears, there is no disease, there is no curse anymore. We are in heaven. We are glorified without sin, pain, death. Well, then uh, everything that happened in my life actually is working together for good somehow. It's uh, part of life for me. I learn things in life, good things and bad things. We are, we are learning. What if you say, I'm not learning? Well, you will one day. One day it'll be very clear to you. But now we see through a glass darkly, and that later we will see face to face. But now we have the possibility, if you choose, uh, to have receive the engrafted word that will enlighten our eyes. Psalm 19, James 1, 21, 
we see what it, what it is. Let me show you a, a sub point here that maybe some of you have seen me do it before. Psalm 19, the testimony of the Lord. I think we have to turn there. I, mean, I do have my eye on the on the clock. I'm not going to keep you long, but I I want you to see this. <clears throat> The law of the, verse 7, 19, 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Do we see it? Okay. Well, here, this is box is me. But when the law of the Lord comes, he converts us. So I'll draw a circle. He changes us. New nature. New nature. We, 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 are, we are changed. We are regenerated by the word of the Lord. Next one. The testimony of the Lord is short, making wise the simple. So here's another one. This is me, and I put on here a graduation cap. <laughs> what happened? We, we have first one is conversion, converted. Next one is you become wise. How? You become wise. That's a good goal in life. But looking unto Jesus, and Jesus is, is wisdom. And when we walk with Jesus, we have the spirit of wisdom. And we begin to understand things about, about life. We are able to navigate in life, and life is hard. Sometimes very hard. But look at what we have to live with. Look at verse 7. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. The next one, statues of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. So here, the next one is a circle, a cap, and then what's the happy face, is it? Yes, there it is happy face are you changing yes this really happens to us this is a thing that you want in your life and it will happen little by little it's called sanctification yes my life is actually changing I'm actually learning and believing and embracing in my heart and then there is one more commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes so we'll give the we'll we'll do that one, which is the the cap. The guy's happy and he's got big eyes. <laughs> what did this? What? How did this change happen? It's the the word, and it's various phrases for it: law of the Lord, testimony of the Lord, statutes of the Lord, the commandment of the Lord, the Bible. The Bible did it. That's how it happened. So, so now, we, now we go to, like this is sanctification, but now we go back to Romans 8, and we'll read these verses about who we are. You might say, none of that has happened to me or I don't see that happening to me. Well, then look at what has happened to you in the mind of God. It's Romans 8, verse 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's us. He foreknew us. This is providence of God. This is something he did in his plan. There's no accident in it. It's intentional. It's something that he, almighty God, did. He foreknew and predestinated us to be conformed to his son. When we read the Gospels, we see who the son of God is. We see his power, we see his wisdom, his patience, his love, his compassion. And to think that we would be conformed to him, this is remarkable. Well, how does it happen? Verse 30. 
whom he did predestinate, and we can make a, a chain here. One link is predestination. Them he called, another link is called. Whom he called, he justified. There's another link in the chain. Whom he justified, them he glorified. There's another link. Hmm? Predestinated. And the predestinated are the ones foreknown. We have five, five chain links, all linked. Can they be broken? Can any of these links be broken? If we have man and God, and if the links were dependent on man, we can be sure the chain would break. Wherever man would have a responsibility in that chain, it would one day break, because man can't do it. Man can't keep his salvation. God keeps it. Man cannot predestinate. God predest Man cannot call. God calls him. Man cannot do these five things. Let's read them again. He cannot foreknow. He cannot predestinate. He cannot call himself, he cannot be justified by himself, and he cannot be glorified by himself. All those things happen from heaven, from God, in the heart of God. What's the meaning of it? These things are so extraordinary for us, because we are so used to being in the program, so used to like being part of the solution, or are so used to like thinking, I need to perform. I need to do this in order to be saved. I need to be participating in this in order for it to happen. But Abraham, when he met God, God made a covenant. And Abraham, it says, he fell asleep. And there was a burning furnace that went between the split animals. And there were, God was with God, making a covenant with himself for the covenant with Abraham that would be unconditional. Abraham could not break it. It would not be dependent on Abraham. It would be dependent upon God in his sovereignty, in his providence, to be faithful to Abraham and his seed for thousands of years unto the coming of Christ and beyond. He said in the prophet Jeremiah, if you can change the coming up of the sun and the going down of the sun, then you can change the covenant I made with Abraham. But nobody here can change the coming up of the sun in the morning or the going down. No, it's impossible, nor can you break the covenant he made with him. This is important for the foundation of our faith because it's all about God's grace. It's God's grace that did this. So now go to verse 31. So what shall we then say to these things? What things? The five links of the chain. What can we say about these things? That everything works for good for us. What can we say about it? It leaves us speechless. I have nothing to say. I cannot say only that he loves me. This is important that our hearts would get in tune with this kind of grace, this kind of love where God would say, I chose you. You did not choose me. I chose you in John 15. But there is an re automatic reaction in our heart to the teaching of this because we say, yeah, yeah, okay, he loved me. Well, what should I do? Can I just live an ungodly life? Well, go ahead and live an ungodly life. Haven't you done that already? <laughs> yeah, but I want to do it more. Well, then go ahead and do it more. That's your call. You make a bed and you sleep in it. If you haven't yet found out that a sinful life is not very edifying, not freeing, not liberating, not godly, not joyful, not envisionary, creative, imaginative. If I haven't found out that, then, then follow Christ and find it out. When you follow Christ, you find out who he is, and it's better. 
much better. Okay, verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So because he's such a good teacher, the Holy Spirit and the Apostle Paul, he's very good at rhetorical guiding our thinking. He's very good at, as a teacher bringing up everything. If God is for us, who can be against us? Like, if God is for me, then who? Well, I tell you, God, who could be against me? The devil is against me. My sin nature is against me. Life itself, maybe, is against me. Okay. Verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things, all meaningful things, all things that are wise, all things that lead to godliness, all things that build us up in faith? Well, how will he not with him freely, freely, you see the word, freely give us all things? Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Now, this has a sound of uh, jurisprudence, legality, a courtroom. In a courtroom, you have a bench and a judge. Like the judge would be where I am. This is the bench. Then you have the docket where the accused is. You have the prosecutor over here. And the defendant has an advocate. He has, a, he has an attorney or an advocacy on the side. And the accuser, the prosecutor, is bringing before the judge. And he's saying to the judge, I have a case against him. I am accusing him. And, it, and so there's real evidence that you are wrong, very great evidence that you are a sinner, great evidence that you're unfaithful, great evidence that you betray, you deceive, that you cheat, you're a hypocrite, you're a liar, great evidence. They have it all piled up against you, okay? I was thinking at the Last Supper when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, and what, did, what were the responses? But there were, there, there were, Lord, is it I? And then they were all saying, Lord, is it me? That's how I, I read it that way. I don't remember the chapter and verses exactly, but is it, is it me? Is it me? Why did they all say? And none of them said, is it Judas? None of them said that. And they, they had to, like a couple of different responses. But... I like that part, is it me? Do you know why they all said, is it me? Because all of us have that. It could be me. I know it, I feel it in my heart. I'm a coward. I know I could chicken out. I know I could betray you, right? That's like we all have a Judas Iscariot in us. So when the prosecutor says, uh, you're a betrayer, somehow it hits me and I say, yeah, maybe I am. And this courtroom is very, uh, uh, it's constant actually. It's our conscience and it's our understanding of God and it goes against us. But God is teaching us something because of the five links of the chain that cannot be broken that he is saying, I have justified you and made you righteous when actually you aren't. I, I am on your side. I have called you. I gave you my son to pay for your sin. And so you have a relationship with God. And when God hears the case, Christ, the advocate, stands forth and says, yes, but I took it all upon me. I paid the price for it all. And so the judge says, you are free. 
to the to the, you and me you are you are free you are justified you are saved god is for you not against you actually you some of you may not believe what i'm saying and i agree it's too incredible but actually what it says here is exactly what i'm saying let's read it verse 30 30 uh, Three, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who, it is God who justifies. So the judge will say, Christ is the advocate. I have shed my blood. I paid the price. I did it all. I bore the sin. I was judged by the Father. I have been raised from the dead. I am seated at the right hand. And this is my child. So I am justified. Verse 34, who is he that condemns? And there's a lot of that. Who is he that condemns? Well, my, the civil world can condemn me for a crime. Same bench, not the same, but the, the template is the same. There's a civil court. I, I am found prosecuted for a crime. I am judged. The judge says seven years in prison. I go away to prison. And so according to the civil court, I am found guilty of a crime, and I go to prison to pay for the crime. But while I am living in the prison, I know of some, another court, another court that does not charge me. Another court where I have been forgiven. Another court where God is on my side, that Christ is my advocate. Another court that is in heaven that is saying, who is he that, what is it, condemns him? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. That word intercession is not only the idea of prayer, but he's the one that comes forth in the courtroom and says to the judge, it's impossible for you to find him guilty, for it is I that became guilty in his place. It is impossible. You cannot find him. That's your, what do you say? And the judge says, he is set free. He has been justified. Okay, go now to verse 35. He goes further. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Can our sin? No. Can our troubles, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? What can separate us from the love? It is written... For your sake, we are killed all the day long. We heard a great message on that this past week. We go to the slaughter. Pastor Mihail, I believe I said, he said, we are fattened up for the slaughter. We go to the slaughter. It doesn't sound very good, but that's what it says in Psalm 44. The Jewish people were taken to the slaughter. And unfortunately, we have seen that in history. They have been killed all the day long. They have been hunted down. They have been persecuted. They have been hurt tremendously as a, as a, uh, uh, um, a race of people, actually a race of people that have been hunted and persecuted and brought to the slaughter. But this is said from Psalm 44, but it applies to us too. Guys, we are in a world where these things happen. We are persecuted. We have find ourselves in trouble. We are wrongly understood, misunderstood. We are um, sometimes mistreated and so on. I mean, I mean, this is the meaning here. But, but we have a shepherd. We have, we have a shepherd who has decided in himself Nothing can break the covenant that I have with you. 
Nothing can separate me from loving you. Nothing can take you away from me. I am your father. I will always be there. I am faithful. I am the answer for your life. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am your savior. I am your healer. I am your provision. I am the banner over the house. I am the way, I am the door, I am the shepherd, I am the rock. I am the, the captain of your salvation. I am your big brother. I am the living God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am God. I, I will never leave you, never forsake you. Nothing can separate you from me. Think about it. Verse 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You know, everybody is conquered someday. Everybody in the earth is conquered one day. Everybody. You're conquered by a cancer. You're conquered by death. You're conquered by a broken heart. You're broken by a depression. You're conquered by disappointments. Everybody in this world is conquered. Why, how does it say you are more than a conqueror? Because of these rings. Yeah, what can conquer those rings? What can break that chain? What can separate you from God? You are more than a conqueror. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your what? Victory. Come on, where, where is it? One of our heroes in the faith, who I have a lot of respect for, Timothy Keller, planted this incredible church and churches in New York City. And uh, what a, a brilliant man, what an incredible teacher. And, uh, and he just passed away with pancreatic cancer. And um, uh, what can we say? Like one day, That'll happen to you and me. Death, that is, not that cancer necessarily, but death, there it is. Yeah, but no, we're not conquered. We're not. We live forever. We leave our bodies and we will be with Christ. And I, I think that hope that hope, you know, we, let me say one other thing and I'll finish here. Um, this word hope in English is usually not, I haven't liked that word, kind of like all my kind of hope. It's very weak to me and I realize why. Because in the English language, it, it has a sound of uncertainty, the way we use it. It's like, I hope so. You know, are you going to get a good, are you going to get a new job? I hope so. Maybe not. Maybe. So we could put percentages here. 10% possibility. How about people that play the lottery, which I think is a waste of money, but anyway. Like, I hope I, it's like, yeah, okay. I don't like the word that much. But in the Bible, it's a different, it's different. In a biblical, the New Testament, it doesn't mean something uncertain. It actually means the opposite. It's a guarantee. It's a hope. It's a, called a living hope in the book of Titus, isn't it? A living hope. It's like 100%. It's like how you live. You have to live with hope. And the more sure it is, the better it is for you. Have you ever been without hope? Have you ever been in a very troubled situation where you lost hope? It's horrible. I, I've tasted the edge of it. Just like to think that you're stuck. Nobody knows you're there. Pastor Binu mentioned it in his message. Those were they hikers that went in the cave in Thailand and the floods came and filled the cave with water and they were in there four kilometers in the cave, was that the story, something like this? 
and they were, they were without hope. The, the cave filled with water. They were stuck four kilometers in the cave without people knowing and no communication and 10 days and uh, very close to dying. Horrible. No hope. No phone, no connection. Detached. Lost. Horrible. The opposite is this one. We're going to heaven. We're going to die. But that's okay because we're going to, we live forever. I mean, it's not okay, but I have hope. I don't know how things are going to turn out. But Jesus said, and God said, and God is, and this is what we believe and how we relate to life. What a joy it is to be encouraged with this kind of hope. So let me read it to finish. I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present or things to come, height, depth, any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Lord, our prayer is that some of these words would just stick in our hearts that yeah, we've heard all week. We had a great time now, summer, and ahead of us to learn through the summer and for you to lead us in our spiritual life. Maybe someone here hasn't started their spiritual life. Please start today by believing in Christ in your heart. Write the, the birthday down, spiritual birthday. Write it down on this day. What, what day is it? June 26, tw 25. Don't make a mess up the day. <laughs> June 25, 2023, my spiritual birthday. Today, I've decided to put my trust in Christ, the living God. You have questions, you can get answers. Uh, you, have, you have doubts, you have fears, God will help you. You are frail, you are weak, God, God is real and he loves you. If your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. God is your advocate. God is your savior. Walk by faith in him. And purpose this summer to stay away from the bad stuff and embrace the good stuff. Purpose in your heart that God will protect you through the summer and guide you and lead you in life in joy and in peace. Make a plan and intentionally in your heart. Make a plan in your heart. I'm going to embrace Jesus and walk with Jesus by faith and learn his way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. And um, just pray. Uh, Father, we just want again lift up those who are traveling, whether it's back to Europe or Asia or Africa or Canada, South America. Father, thank you for this amazing, amazing two weeks pre convention, convention, for what we've heard this morning. Father, we pray that you would just, we would be exercised. You would stir the things that we've heard this morning, through this week, through last week. Divine appointments on the airplane, on the road, on the trains. God, we are a people on a mission from you. Thank you for this seeing. Thank you for this time. Pray for tonight's service, 630, this week. God, just give us traveling mercies. Bless our fellowship. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You are dismissed. <laughs>